Now, Ian, when you see a patient, you have a huge phase one unit at the Royal Marston, mm -hmm. and you have all these um, uh, potentially targeted agents you could give. You know, do you use any of these tests as well, more in the experimental setting than, than standard? Yeah, so uh, we certainly uh, have conducted a study to try to uh, have um, all comers coming through our clinic as a new patient and then do what Elena uh, alluded to, do next generation sequencing, have you know a panel of however many genes you want to put, put on and then try to uh, either influence their subsequent treatment or as you said, direct them to the, to the relevant uh, 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 relevant clinical trial. Uh, in fact, we actually presented some data in, in this year's ASMO conference on, on our experience, but we actually face several things in real life, okay? Um, number one, actually, when we uh, say we want to do all these sophisticated tests, a lot of our patients are diagnosed in a referring hospital. These are gastroenterologists that work in a referring hospital. They said they saw a tumor. They said, according to the guideline, they take six biopsies. Of the six biopsies, not all of them actually got tumor in it. Okay, so by the time they got the, uh, they bring it in, it might down to only about three of them got some tumor in it. And of the tumor, those that got tumor, the tumor content may not be very good. And then by the time you choose the one that got high content, and then you try to extract the DNA, and you're down to very small amounts of DNA. And you know, uh, you know, it does pose some challenge in the as we try to push this onto everyday practice. It's actually. Uh, not as simple as research study, where we said we're going to get a fresh biopsies, we're going to get that straight to the lab, process it, uh, etc. So I think there are many steps as we try to take this onto a, 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 a large scale onto the routine clinical practice. Uh, so you know to, to target it. Now, uh, of course, then you know despite having a big phase one unit, you know they, you know they, it all also depends on at that time what kind of clinical trials are available. Uh, and uh, and it, you don't always able to match. And there are, perhaps somewhat disappointingly, there are some data coming out to say, well, when you match it with, you know, so-called match limitations with the clinical trial, these patients still may not necessarily uh, uh, benefit a lot. So I think it just tells us the complexity of the cancer and sometimes even if we know a mutation it does not mean that in that disease that is really the driver mutation uh, for it and and the drug that they're testing may not necessarily be the best of that target so just in just because you've got a PI3 kinase inhibitor doesn't mean that it will work in well if any of you know PI3 kinase mutations as you said is a common mutation in gastric cancer uh, so you know, I think we certainly do want to match it, but you know, I mean, Joe, you run a big unit as well. Maybe you can tell us about your, your experience. Well, I, th I think you're right. I think what, what we have is we are mostly focusing on just getting those patients tested yeah. and saying, okay, let's try to find out about as much about these tumors as we can. Sometimes we find a matching mutation or an amplification that would work for the patient. But if not, there's new agents coming every day where we can see a pathway that might be aberrant or the mutation might make them more susceptible to like a PARP inhibitor that will make will drive us towards treating that patient in a certain way and I think aggregating the data sort of like the T TCGA analysis the more we get on data in in real life and real patients who have these cancers um, the more we can learn as we get more agents and we get more knowledge about things. Um, so I think it's important to test, but just like you said, just because we find one match doesn't mean that, that everything will come true, um, but it also means that we, we could find a direction yeah. to go. Um, so I think, I think one of the most important things is to tell people not to be afraid to test. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I have clinicians saying, you know, I want to check the molecular profiling, but I don't know what to do with the results. Yeah. And I think that's where I say to the clinicians, well, use the results that would change your standard, like the HER2. But if you don't know what to do with the results, that's the perfect time to refer or call one of us or, or colleagues yeah. around that do the research. They can say, hey, this makes sense or this doesn't make sense, but don't feel that pressure to know all the answers when you get that result back. You make a really good point about that. I mean, I think that, you know, with without consolidating the different data that we have, we won't know. You know, it, it might be that um, diffuse gastric cancer or genomically stable gastric cancer is better treated with a taxane than a can, and that may actually be important in the second line setting. Or ramucirumab might be very good for a subtype or not. So I think having that data will be very important. And I just wanted to come back to one other point that, that was mentioned by Ian. Um, the um, 
currently the, the TCGA, the analysis, was not only just sequencing, but also expression profiling and methylation and a pretty comprehensive analysis. And for most patients uh, with the biopsy, it's, it's actually challenging to get all that information. So I think um, with uh, better technology, we might be able to do that, but it may be that patients need to get another biopsy to actually adequately profile their tumor so that we can actually uh, use it for their future care. And speaking, you were talking a lot about these mutations, and there, what, what um, Yelena was talking about is the somatic mutations, ones that happen with inside the tumor. But what about the germline mutations? What about the hereditary syndromes that can lead to gastric cancer? Manish, yeah. you know a lot about these. So, yeah, thank you. So um, about 10% of gastric cancers, you know, a patient with gastric cancer will say that they had a family history of gastric cancer. Um, and of those, the most common by far is the hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. Uh, these are caused by a germline mutation in CDH1, which is uh, e cadherin. Uh, Elena um, alluded to this as sort of pathognomonic mnemonic for the genomically stable type. They have uh, mutations in, in um, cell surface proteins and uh, proteins important in gap junctions. Um, so a germline mutation or a constitutional mutation in CDH1 um, is associated with gastric cancer. And in fact, um, this, is, this is actually very important because the risk of gastric cancer in these patients um, is about 1% per year starting at age 20. So um, the standard of care um, is to undergo a prophylactic gastrectomy, um, often in the early 20s, to prevent future gastric cancers. And there's been a lot of data, um, at least 150 patients published um, with regard to the experience with gastric cancer and, and, and prophylactic gastrectomy. And many of these patients have already precancerous lesions or nests within the wall of the stomach that were um, silent. Um, other hereditary syndromes, Lynch syndrome um, is associated with gastric cancer, and also FAP is uh, associated with gastric cancer, and that's actually really quite interesting. Um, so a mutation um, in the APC gene it affects beta catenin signaling, and, um, and not only is it important in colon cancer, which we all know about, but it's also important um, in gastric cancer. It gives you a tenfold risk. So there are things to be uh, wary about, and so I think I always I always ask my patients about, you know, what is their family history because it comes up not too infrequently.